The purpose of this uh, Academy of Global Governance is put together, put in contact uh, decision makers, high officials and the academics. What do you think about this exchange of views and experience between the academy and the, uh, the world of the practice? Yeah, uh, it's extremely important, particularly in the, the uh, era in which we live, in which there are so many challenges for Europeans, uh, for people outside of Europe and, and for the, those that are involved in the study of and, and uh, the functioning of the EU, that we have these types of engagements. Uh, we need conversations about uh, and, and in involving discussions of what the EU is in global politics, what's its international identity, what should it be doing, what is the best way. If we don't have these types of conversations, if we don't have these types of um, academies and engagements, then we will retreat into nationalist isolation, which is the weakness of Europeans um, in these wider discussions. For more than 10 years, and you, you studied and you you are writing about the international identity of the European Union. Mm -hmm. How do you see the current crisis? Uh, do you think it's affecting the international identity of the European Union? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, as we've discussed on, in the course so far, the training uh, academy so far, the, the, the context in which we understand the international identity of the EU is critical to the study of and the the, the knowledge of the EU's international identity. It's not just the crisis, it's the, the history of the EU's engagement with international challenges, whether they're economic, whether the war on terrorism, whether they're um, movements and mobilizations for democracy, uh, the end of communism. All of these factors are important shaping factors in understanding the EU's international identity. And we really need to understand them. It is not simply the EU has a type of international identity and then it imposes it on its actions with the rest of the world. The EU is constituted and shaped by those interactions. So, for the economic crisis, for example, it's interesting to see the extent to which it has a, a mobilizing effect on forcing Europeans to become aware that whether they like it or not, they're economically bound together. And that effect of binding means they have to think about how they can be more effective, but also more engaging with the rest of the world, because it's not just a European crisis, it has had consequences everywhere. Another uh, key concept uh, in your intellectual work is the normative power. Yeah. European Union as a normative power. In this context we are living now, is still working this kind of concept? Ah, yeah, I think the, the idea of normative power, the idea that there are um, types of engagements, types of relationships between the EU and the rest of the world. Uh, and those aren't simply about economic incentives, and they're not simply about the use of physical force, they are about the power of ideas, and the normative justification of those ideas is a critically important idea of our time. It has become, I think, more important in an era in which the EU is challenged internationally, globally, by other actors who have very different ideas about how the international system should work, how the United Nations work, and how global governance should work or not. And it's in that struggle of idea that we need to have an analytical framework, an apparatus for making sense of how the EU interacts with other actors, whether it's at the upper global level in diplomatic actions, or on the lower ground level of policies and positions and the uh, deployment of uh, representations of, of diplomacy that, that are really central to to getting a bigger sense of the role of the EU in global governance. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.